Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the mailbag version of and the less formal, more casual, kind of laid back version of AMC Movie Talk. My name is John Campia. I am the editor in chief of um, all things AMC Movie News, and I am so glad uh, you decided to make this a part of your day today. And, you know, this is a much more relaxed, casual, and formal version of AMC Movie Talk. We're just going to sit here for the next half hour to an hour talking movies. What's going on in the movies, a little bit of insight, a little bit of this, that, and the other thing. I'm going to just be taking your questions uh, from the mailbag. Uh, today's show is getting up a little bit late, and I'll, I'll tell you why it's getting up a little bit late and why tomorrow's show, Sunday's mailbag, will also be late. It's because um, I'm getting ready to go to Vegas. I'll be in Vegas all next week, Monday through Friday, at this event called CinemaCon. And what CinemaCon is, uh, CinemaCon is this um, convention, if you will, uh, put on by NATO, which is not the North American, you know, the, the Defense Alliance. It is the North American theaters, theater owners, uh, the Association of North American Theater Owners. And it is a big annual thing where all theater owners from across North America get together, talk about the industry. The, stu the reason why I'm going um, is because a part of CinemaCon is that all the studios go, at least most of them do, the big ones do. And they put on these, like, hour and a half, two hour presentations. And a lot of the times they give us, you know, like five, 10, 15, 20 minute uh, clips of movies they've got coming up over the next year. And they usually give a lot of stuff. They show a lot of stuff. They give a lot of insight, a lot of information there. There's a couple of full screenings there. Um, and it's really, as a massive film fan, it's really enjoyable. Uh, for somebody like me to go and be a part of that. It's great. And I'm really looking forward to it. So I'm going to be gone there. Uh, Monday through Friday, uh, Dennis and Amy Rose will be kind of running the show with AMC Movie Talk, and I'll try to Skype in now and again. And I'm also going to be doing daily video blogs from Vegas, um, telling you guys and showing you pictures and video of everything that I'm seeing. I can't shoot video inside the studio presentations, but all the all the uh, displays and uh, all of the booths and uh, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm going to be taking a lot of pictures and telling you guys what I'm seeing, explaining to you what it is I've experienced that day. So I'm going to be doing like a five minute video blog every day. Uh, so watch for that on our AMC movie channel as well. We might actually put that in as a part of AMC movie talk uh, Monday through Friday. So I'm kind of looking forward to that. Um, now, before we get to the questions today, I saw a piece of news um, that I wanted to talk about for a minute. You'll remember that on AMC Movie Talk yesterday, for those of you that watch, uh, we talked about the fact that there is a Gem in the Holograms movie coming. That's right. Before we get a Wonder Woman movie, before we get a Thundercats movie, before we get another Masters of the Universe, we are getting a Gem in the Holograms movie. Uh, being directed by John M. Chu, the director of just the Justin Bieber documentary, Never Say Never, and uh, the most recent G.I. Joe film, G.I. Joe Retaliation. And so... I kind of moaned and whined a little bit on, on yesterday's show that, like, come on, John M. Chu, you, you told us that you had to step away because for a long time, John M. Chu was supposed to be directing a new Masters of the Universe movie. He was supposed to be directing a new He-Man movie. And then that got shelved because they said John M. Chu is going to come back to direct the next G.I. Joe film, G.I. Joe 3. And then comes this news that he's doing Gem and the Holograms. And I'm like, well, come on, dude. I mean... You said now you can't do Masters of the Universe because you got to do this G.I. Joe thing, and now you're doing Gem and the Holograms? Anyway, um, and I've met John M. Chu. I've talked with John M. Chu. Very cool dude. Very cool dude. So please don't misinterpret my whining uh, as if he's some kind of jerk. He's not. Very cool dude, John M. Chu. Um, so anyway, then comes this news this morning that not only you know was He-Man cast aside... Uh, for Gem and the Holograms, but that it looks like the next G.I. Joe film, G.I. Joe 3, is also being pushed back indefinitely because of Je so they can make room for Gem and the Holograms. Now, the official story that came out is this, is that uh, John M. Chu was tweeting back and forth with somebody where he expressed, you know, this is what Chu said. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but I think I'm capturing the essence of what John was saying. He said, you know, um, we've almost got the script just right and then John M. Chu says, but it has to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. So 
I figure I'll squeeze in a little, another little, you know, outrageous movie between now and then, AKA Gem and the Holograms. And um, so the official explanation is he's going to squeeze in another little film while they're making the G.I. Joe film what he calls perfect. Because he says it's almost it's almost there, but it's got to be perfect. And, you know, I'll, I'll often complain about stuff like this because it doesn't take eight months to write a script. Um, for, you know, a screenwriter who is employed doing other things and he screenwrites on his spare time, maybe he can take that long. But when you've got, you know, professional screenwriters, these guys know what they're doing and they've already got a draft of the script done. And the director says, it's it's almost there. It's really coming along great, but it's just got to be perfect. It, yeah, it doesn't take six months. Just tell them what things you want changed. I mean, the notorious story I keep falling back on is... Um, Joss Whedon, and I forget the director of Cabin in the Woods, because uh, Joss Whedon was the, the writer and the producer, but the director of the film was also the writer. And there's this great story that Joss Whedon tells about him and this writer went to a cabin or a hotel or something for a weekend, wrote the script for Cabin in the Woods in a weekend. Wrote it in a weekend. I'm sure they fine-tuned it and and you know gave another pass or two at it as it went. But you know the story goes... Did it in a weekend. Now, not all movies are like that. I'm not trying to suggest that they are. But if you've got a script that is almost there, it's really good, but it just needs to be perfect, and you've got a good team of writers, and you know what your vision is, it doesn't take six months, four months, three months, two months for them to get to that point. So do me a favor. Don't tell me you're pushing off G.I. Joe so the writers can get it perfect. And in the meantime, you're going to do Gem and the Holograms. Just call it what it is. We're not ready to do G.I. Joe. Just, just call it what it is. Respect our intelligence. Don't pass off to us. Oh, yeah, yeah, the script's almost there. But it's just got to be perfect. Uh, give them nine more months to just take it from almost there to perfect. Don't, don't tell us that. Just call it what it is. And by the way, I'm completely speculating completely speculating, all cards on the table. I'm not trying to be deceptive and saying I know something that nobody else knows. Not at all. I'm just speculating. But come on, man. Just call it call it what it is. Just say there are problems with G.I. Joe. Just say there, there, there are some things that are, are holding it up. Just say we're not ready to do it for this reason, that reason, whatever. Or don't even give us the reason. Just say, look, for one reason or another, G.I. Joe's held up, we're having problems. So while we get those problems worked out and while the studio figures out what we want to do, I'm going to do Gem and the Holograms. Just say that. Just say that. Um, but this whole thing, yeah, I'm, I'm going to squeeze an entire wide release major studio motion picture just while my writers get this other one perfect. I Because I, I, I don't believe that the studio has given John M. Chu so much power that they say, oh, really? You're, you're not, you don't quite think the script is quite perfect yet? No problem, John M. Chu. You call the shots. We'll put the movie off a year. I don't think that's the relationship between John M. Chu and the studio. I just call me a pessimist, but I don't think that's the relationship between John. I mean, for heaven's sakes, if a filmmaker like J.J. Um, Abrams can ask, the studio, Disney, yeah, in this case, and say, hey, look, I wouldn't mind pushing back the release date of Star Wars. I mean, if a J.J. Abrams can ask that and the studio goes, nope, you knew what the release date was and what the deadline was when you took the job. That's the deadline. You got to stick to it. Um, then I don't believe that a director like John M. Chu, who I think has a very bright future in this business, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he does. I, I wasn't a big fan of G.I. Joe Retaliation, you know, full disclosure. But I, I think that was a challenging film to do, I, especially coming off of the first one, which was pretty bad, but not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. And especially when you're faced with this daunting task of, okay, you got to get rid of all the old characters and bring in the new bring in new characters led by The Rock. I mean, that's a tough uphill challenge to fight. And I think while I did not love G.I. Joe Retaliation, I think you still got to respect the job that John M. Chu did with that film. And I was kind of looking forward to seeing how he evolves that franchise. Now that it's kind of his and that he's got one film under his belt 
in the franchise. I was looking forward to seeing what he was going to do next. And at this point, I'm starting to doubt it's going to happen. Um, so, yeah, anyway, that was just something I wanted to talk about because I, it caught my attention earlier and I wanted to, to share it with you guys and say, hey, what's up with this? Anyway, this is Mailbag. And now we are going to spend the entire rest of the show just taking your questions that you guys have emailed in to us. Now, listen, you can email questions to us anytime, 24-7, at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. So that's amcmovietalk at gmail.com. And we answer a couple of questions every day on uh, AMC Movie Talk, Monday through Friday. And then we just take a whole bunch of questions today. I think we got seven questions that we're going to take today for AMC Mailbag. So with all that being said, let's get to question number one. And question number one, normally I've got graphics for the emails here. I don't have them today because... I've been rushing to get ready for Vegas, so I didn't have time to put the graphics together, so I'm just going to read the emails. Or you can follow along the email, look in the description of this video, and you'll see the emails are all written out there, so you can follow along. But at any rate, the first email today comes to us from De Denny Alexander, who writes, Hi AMC, I read uh, a news item on Yahoo that Mark Ruffalo's character would be getting a love interest. So... Uh, my question is, do you think Liv Tyler will be returning as Betty Ross, or would Marvel just recast anyone for from The Incredible Hulk? Considering all the issues with production, and it has been almost seven years since the original Incredible Hulk came out. Well, that's an interesting question, Danny. Danny, first of all, let me say this. Um, I don't know that that's a fact, that they're giving Mark Ruffalo a, uh, a love interest in the new movie. Um, it's... It's quite possible they are, but I, I don't know that that's an actual fact. But let's assume for a second that that's the case. It's a very interesting question. Will they bring in Liv Tyler? Uh, because remember, this film, the, the, the Hulk in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the way they've set it up, is the same Hulk from the Edward Norton, the Incredible Hulk. Not from Ang Lee's Hulk, that came before that, but Edward Norton's Incredible Hulk is part of the continuity of this current Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, they've changed actors. Edward Norton is no longer playing Dr. Banner. Uh, Mark Ruffalo is. But in that movie, Betty Ross, the classic love interest for, for Dr. Banner, was played by Liv Tyler. And I actually thought Liv Tyler was pretty good um, in that film. So, if they're going to give Dr. Banner a love interest... Could it be Liv Tyler? Look, I'll say this. I have heard nothing about Liv Tyler joining the cast of Avengers 2. Um, but since it is the same continuity, it's possible. I think it would be really cool. Unless they're not going to make it Betty Ross. Unless they make some explanation that Betty went off and married somebody else because of all the issues with the Hulk and Dr. Banner constantly having to be on the run. And so she moved on with her life and now he's got a new love interest. That's cool, too. That's totally fine. Not that we know they're giving him a love interest, but we already covered that. But I think it would be really cool if they did bring back Liv Tyler. I think that would put a definitive... You know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that the Hulk uh, from The Incredible Hulk is the same Hulk as in this current uh, Marvel Universe. We forget that because they did change actors. But it was just a change of actors. The Hulk in The Avengers was not a rebooted Hulk. It's the Hulk from The Incredible Hulk. And I think it would be a really cool statement for Marvel to bring Liv Tyler in to be Betty Ross. Now, maybe that's not the direction they want to go with their story. And for narrative purposes, they don't want to do that. And all that's cool. I'm just saying it's a really cool question. It's a great question, Denny. And I would be very happy if they said that Dr. Banner is going to have a love interest, focus a little bit more on his character than we, what we got in the last Avengers movie. And make it Liv Tyler. Make it Betty Ross. Make it his classic love. Uh, I think that would be really cool. So I'm all on board for that. All right. Let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from uh, Stetson Robinson, Robinson, who writes, Hey, AMC. Love the show. Never miss it. Thank you so much, Stetson. Uh, my question is about the film Snowpiercer. Uh, the trailer was amazing, and I've been waiting forever for it to get released in America. I saw that it's finally coming here in June. Why did it take almost a full year to come to the U.S., and why did the studio want to cut the film shorter for the for American audiences? Also, are you interested in seeing it? Thanks. For those of you who don't know what he's talking about, um, uh, Snowpiercer 
is uh, this film starring Chris Evans. And it's about, it's set, I think, in like 2031. It's set a little bit in the future. And what the whole premise is, is that there was an experiment to fix global warming. But the experiment went tragically wrong, as experiments often do in movies. The experiment went tragically wrong. And what happened is it sent the Earth into a new ice age, killing almost all life on Earth except... For all these humans who are on this train driven by a perpetual motion engine that literally circles the world, uh, and it it completes its full circle circuit every one year, I think, if I'm remembering uh, correctly. And all the remaining humanity is on this huge long train. And over time, a, a case system has evolved where you have the more uppity ups living near the front of the train and more of the poor and the wretched masses living at the back of the train. And it's about the poor and the wretched wanting to rise up and fix their living conditions and all that kind of stuff. Very interesting premise. I have not seen the film yet, uh, so I can't comment on that. But let me answer the, the last part of your question. Am I interested in it? I'll be honest with you. The trailer didn't thrill me. The, the, I, I didn't find the trailer exceptional. It, it didn't hook me and make me uh, really, you know, jumping up and down to see it. I will say this, though. Um, knowing that Chris Evans is the lead in it makes me a little bit interested. Knowing that uh, Tilda Swinton is in it, kind of is the main bad guy, I believe. That's interesting. And knowing that Jamie Bell, I really like Jamie Bell as an actor. For those of you who don't know, he's been in the news lately because he's going to be the, uh, the thing in the new Fantastic Four babies uh, that they're making. So, and I'm looking forward to seeing him in it. I am, uh, because I think he's a very good actor. And so the cast makes me interested, but so far the trailer. Now, as as far as why did it take a year for it to come? Well, remember, a lot of times in Hollywood, some movies sit on the shelf for like three years, four years. I think, uh, remember that movie that came out like two years ago with Chris Hemsworth um, about the Wolverines, uh, uh, Red Dawn, the, the Red Dawn remake. I believe that film sat on the shelf. That I think that film was shot before Thor was shot. Um, and I think it was sitting on the shelf for like four years. I could be wrong. Jump in the comments section and correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe Red Dawn sat on the shelf for like four years. And then went through, uh, uh, they went through a big change. Like they went from, uh, I think it was the Chinese that were going to invade. And then they changed it from the Chinese to North Koreans and a bunch of different things. But essentially that self, that, that film was shot years and years and years and years before it ever finally hit theater. So for a movie to get picked up by a studio and then have a little bit of a delay before it's released is nothing new because the studio picks it up and they try to find a good window to release it where they think they can, the movie can be positioned for success. And sometimes that means waiting a year. Sometimes it might mean waiting two years or whatever. Um, So it's not terribly uh, unheard of. Why did they cut it? I'm going to guess they felt it wasn't paced paced properly. Um, That's my guess. My guess is that they saw the film and thought, you know what, for North American audiences, we think this will be, uh, will play better if we cut 20 minutes out let's say let's say for argument's sake the movie is two hour and 10 minutes long and they say they think the studio thinks for this kind of movie that's too long we think we should cut like 20 minutes out of it it'll pick up the pace of the film and we think audiences will like it better uh, and once again that's not unusual that's that's for especially for foreign films that are being brought into a north american audi- uh, a north american market that's not unusual at all so um, really with, with Snowpiercer, I don't really see anything unusual. It seems like a standard studio buy, bring it to the audience, finding the right window for it, tightening it up a bit. Nothing unusual there. Now we're just going to have to wait and see the movie and, uh, and see if it's any good. Um, I'm going to see it because of the cast, but like I said, the trailer didn't do much to really get me all that excited. All right, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Anthony Lawrence. And Anthony Lawrence writes... Greeting sons and daughters of AMC, with Phase 2 of the Marvel Universe being implemented, is there any chance that we could see the Submariner, a.k.a. Namor, on the big screen? Uh, thanks a lot for the question, uh, Anthony. Um, for those of you who don't, don't know, and, and most of you who watch this show probably do know this, uh, Namor the Submariner, um, for, for best comparison's sake, is like Marvel's version of uh, Aquaman. Uh, some would say that Aquaman is their version of Submariner. I, I'm not trying to draw comparisons. I'm just saying if you don't know who he is, that's kind of the best comparison I can make. Um, 
And uh, he's with some comic book readers, he's really quite popular. And a lot of people have wondered, why have we not seen a Namor film? I mean, with all of these uh, comic book films going on and all this kind of stuff, where is Namor? Well, here's the thing. Although in the comic books, Namor is a Marvel character, his movie rights do not belong to Marvel. Um, It's much like Spider-Man and the X-Men and the Fantastic Four. Even though those are all Marvel comic book characters, their movie rights do not necessarily belong with Marvel. Um, Here's a a really cool little graph that came out on the internet maybe about a month ago, but this this isn't exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination, but it'll give a, a nice idea as to what we're dealing with. Okay, so what we have here, We have, um, in that blue circle, these are all Marvel characters. And this is a little chart showing about who, which studios own the movie rights to certain Marvel comic book characters. Now, we see in the big circle in the middle there, we've got uh, Marvel Studios. So that's, Marvel Studios actually have the film rights to guys like Thor, Captain America, Hawkeye, Iron Man, Hulk, obviously everybody's been in the Avengers. Uh, But for those we haven't seen yet, to they have the movie rights back for Blade. They didn't have Blade for a long time. Black Panther, Daredevil is now back with Marvel Studios. Uh, Ant-Man, Elektra, and things like that. Now in that blue circle, are the Marvel characters that currently their movie rights belong to 20th Century Fox. We have the Fantastic Four, Silver Surfer, all the X-Men related characters, including Wolverine and Cable, uh, Deadpool, and so forth. Now you see in that little green crossover between the red and the blue is Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver. Those are the, for whatever reason, 20th Century Fox and Marvel Studios, uh, when they originally uh, worked out their deals, for whatever reason, the language allowed for Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver to be used by both studios. And that's why in the upcoming X-Men Days of Future Past, we're going to have Quicksilver. And in Avengers 2, we're going to have a different Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch. And the reason all that's possible is because of the, the, the particular language in the deal when they originally cut the deal. At any rate, now you see... Under uh, In the pink circle there, Sony Pictures, they own uh, the Spider-Man universe, including Venom, Sinister Six, all that kind of stuff that belongs with Spider-Man. Um, and then up at the top in that little yellow circle is Universal. And Universal Pictures have got one guy, Namor the Submariner. Um, so you see, uh, Anthony, Marvel cannot make a Namor the Submariner movie, nor the, can they put Namor the Submariner in the Avengers. If we're going to get a Namor movie, the Submariner, it's got to come from Universal at the moment. Now, I don't know what the details of their, their deal is. I don't know if they have to, if uh, when that deal runs out, or if they don't make a Namor movie by 2016, then the rights revert back to Marvel. I'm sure at some point they do, but I don't know what the details are. But I do know that as of right now, uh, if we're ever going to get a Namor movie, they got it's got to be done by Universal. But the tricky thing here with Universal is this, is I believe that Namor is the only character they have. Like, with Fox, they've got the X-Men, so they got like 50 characters they can put into a movie. Sony's got Spider-Man and all of his connected characters, which means they can have Spider-Man, and they can have Electro, and they can have, you know, Kraven, and they can have Rhino, and they can have Venom, and they can have Carnage, and they can have J. Jonah Jameson, and they can have, you know, Mary Jane, all that kind of stuff. And so you can make, uh, you can have your own kind of superhero universe. I believe Universal just has Namor. So now, correct me if I'm wrong, those of you, that's the great thing about this show and this, you know, the Sons of AMC, all of us together, is that collectively we are all much smarter than any one doofus sitting behind the microphone here. So if you happen to know more uh, than what I'm relating right now, please leave it in the comments section. But I believe that Namor is the only guy they got. So that makes it challenging to make a superhero movie when that's the only, you only have one marquee name, Namor, and that's it. Um, And as far as I know, there are no immediate plans by Universal to make a Namor movie. So there you go. That's the best answer I've got for you on that. Sorry uh, that it took me a little bit long to read that off. Okay, anyway, let's move on to the next question today. And the next question today comes to us from Connor Brown, who writes... Hey, sons and daughters of AMC, I was wondering, it seems that everyone asks for a Friends movie, including myself, but what about a That 70s Show movie? Uh, The last two seasons were were underwhelming and the series finale left somewhat 
uh, some kind of major plot lines unfinished. The show has a big enough worldwide audience that the studio would make profit on a 30 to $40 million budget. Do you think it would be a good idea if they did this? And do you think we will see one in the near future? Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Connor. No, no. Um, they would absolutely lose their shirts if they made a that 70s movie. And one of the things to keep in mind is you'd made a comparison about um, Friends. The thing about Friends is, that show Friends, is it was like the number one show forever. And when it went off air, it was still massively popular. Uh, I believe the season finale, the, the, the series finale for Friends, I believe was like a, just a monster hit. It was just a monster in the ratings. Um, that So Friends was a show that had been top dog for a very long time. And when it was finished, it finished as top dog. I mean, it was still wildly popular. And so could you return to a show like that? Yeah, you could. You could do a Friends film and you could reasonably expect that you'd probably make money. I would, though, with the 70s show, it's a little bit different. The 70s show was never as popular as Friends. And its popularity did this. It sank. Um, and the last couple of seasons weren't just subpar quality-wise. They were losing their audience. Like, they were hemorrhaging audience members. They were losing their audience like mad. They lost a couple of key cast members. They were losing audience. Um, it just, and it wasn't good anymore. Um, and so it really, that was a show that finished, that was pretty popular at a time, and then finished on a whimper. So could you now go back and do a movie of that? I don't think so at all. I, instead of trying to compare that 70s show to a situation like Friends, I think it would be more accurate to compare it to something like um, Veronica Mars. You know, Veronica Mars, fairly popular show. Um, they just did a movie of it. And they opened the film. Now, a lot of people will try to say, yeah, but they opened Veronica Mars so limited. Such a small little release. Well, no. I mean, some films get a limited release, and that means 10 theaters. That means 8 theaters. That means 16 theaters. Veronica Mars, when it came out, if the number isn't exactly right, it is right around, it had around 350 theaters. 350 theaters. Now, that's not a wide release per se, but that ain't a tiny release. That, that's a nationwide release. 350 theaters basically usually means that if you wanted to see a Veronica Mars movie, there was a theater somewhere around you that you could have gone to see it at within a reasonable distance. When it's in 350 theaters, that means, hey, if you were somebody who really wanted to see Veronica Mars, the odds are you could have gone to see it. And what did and Veronica Mars has a very hot star right now. Kristen Bell is is pretty hot. She's got hit movies right now. Um, she's got an ongoing HBO show um, with uh, um, House of Lies that she does with Don Cheadle. Um, she's a big name. She just did Frozen. You know, she's a pretty hot commodity right now. That movie made under under $2 million on its opening weekend. And now in total, I think made about 2.5. And I think that's worldwide. So the Veronica Mars movie, now granted, it wasn't a wide release, but it was 350 theaters, which I contend reasonably means that if you are somebody who really wanted to see it, you could have gone to see it in theater. And it made total under $2.5 million. If you were to make a That 70s Show movie, for what you're suggesting, Connor, of a 30 to $40 million budget, well, that means the movie now has to make probably about 75 to $85 million at the box office just to break even. Just to break even. On a production budget of about, say, for argument's sake, a $40 million production budget, you got to make about 75 to $85 million at the box office just to break even. Um, and if a Veronica Mars is just, with, a Chris, with Kristen Bell in the lead, is only going to make... 2.5 I I can't see that 70s show breaking 15 or 20 uh, and I'm being generous I think I'm being quite generous and that's not a knock on the show but but even the biggest fans of the show will acknowledge that show ended on a whimper a total whimper I don't think anybody's jumping up and down ex excited to see a that 70s show 
I mean, you know, uh, maybe the cast of that 70s show <laughs> is, is, is excited about the idea of doing a that 70s show uh, movie, but I don't think anybody else is. Um, so while I, I appreciate, um, you know, your enthusiasm for it. And I'm sure there are some people out there that would, wouldn't mind a reunion show. I just don't see any studio who would be like, yeah, you know, it'd be a good, a good financial investment. Let's do that. 70 show as a movie. I, I don't think there's anybody saying that right now. So, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. And, and, and by all means, tell me you think I'm wrong in the comment section. That's the great thing. Part about being film fans. I mean, it's all subjective anyway. So go ahead and, and leave me your thoughts in the chat board. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes from Karam. I hope I'm saying your name right. Karam Majub, who writes, Hey guys, love the show. Uh, going back to the 73rd Academy Awards uh, in the, in the uh, year 2000, would you agree that the award for Best Lead Actor should have went to Tom Hanks for Castaway instead of Russell Crowe for Gladiator? I think Russell Crowe did a good job along with the other great actors in that movie. But when you can literally hold a movie all by yourself, and still deliver tons of emotion and actually show struggle, you are definitely a winner. And to me, Tom Hanks did a much better performance. Uh, thanks a lot for the for the question, Karam. Um, that was a really great race that year between Tom Hanks. Now, the other people, um, the other actors in the race that year were Jeffrey Rush for Quills, Javier Bardem, and Ed Harris. Um, so Javier Bardem, Jeffrey Rush, and uh, Javier Bardem, Ed Harris, Jeffrey Rush were the other three actors uh, against Tom Hanks and Russell Crowe. Um, and you raise a great point about how a good chunk of that movie, I'd say about 70% of that movie is just Tom Hanks and his environment, whether it's Wilson, the the uh, volleyball or, or the whale in the water, whatever, it's really just Tom Hanks. And when you can carry a movie on your own, that's an impressive feat. It's one of the reasons why, you know, anybody who ever tries to tell me, oh, Ryan Reynolds can't act. Dudes, you have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, you just don't. And there are a lot of movies that Ryan Reynolds has been in that he's given terrific performances in. But the one I really like to point to is the one he did about two or three years ago um, called Buried. And if you have not seen Buried, you really should. Now, you think it's impressive that Tom Hanks is by himself on an island and floating in the ocean and all that kind of stuff? And it was. That's impressive. It is. But if you think that's impressive, try doing an entire movie, and I kid you not, an entire movie in a box. Not a 10-foot by 15-foot box. A coffin. The movie buried, the entire movie takes place inside the coffin. And it's a story about this guy who was, who was kidnapped by terrorists and buried and now uh, and communicate with him via cell phone, trying to get him to make certain phone calls to get a ransom paid. Um, and the entire movie is Ryan Reynolds laying down, can barely move in a box buried underground. And that's where the entire movie takes place. And Ryan Reynolds gives a performance that I contend should have gotten an Oscar nomination. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to jump up and down and say, he should have won the Oscar. I'm not going to say that, but he should have gotten an Oscar nomination for that. Because you're talking about, you're not even able to move and you, that movie held the audience. That, uh, that performance, and all it is, is his performance. That's the entire movie, is Ryan Reynolds in a box for the entire movie from start to finish. No, never is there another actor on screen and never is he not in the box. And he holds the entire movie. Incredible. Now, getting back to the question at hand uh, about Tom Hanks, um, you know, from Castaway versus uh, the Russell Cooper. I, I thought while Tom Hanks was great, I thought the Russell Crowe performance in Gladiator was special. I really do. I, I, he showed strength and power and compassion and brokenness. And th there was just such a wide range. He got me dramatically into a film that could have come across as a, you know, kind of a clumsy gladiator sword, sand and sword, sword film, you know, sword and sandal film. That's what, it, that's what gladiator could have been. Now, it was in the hands of a terrific director with Ridley Scott and in the hands of a master actor, Russell Crowe, um, who I still contend 
maybe the number two best actor in the world right now behind Daniel Day-Lewis. Uh, for a long time, I said Russell Crowe is the best actor in the world. I'm, I'm, I think I've dropped him down to number two now. But that performance he gave in Gladiator was exceptional. And I think sometimes people miss how good he was in that movie because there is so much else to see. I mean, there's Rome and the arena and all the other gladiators and some killer other actors. And I think that can distract audience members from seeing just how good Russell Crowe was in that film. But I, be I, I do believe he deserved the Oscar for that. Now, had Tom Hanks won the Oscar, I think a lot of you would agree with me that, I, I mean, I don't think you'll hear any of us complain if Tom Hanks won. If Tom Hanks won, I would have gone... Yeah, I, I, I would have given it to Russell Crowe myself, but yeah, Tom Hanks deserved that. I, I wouldn't have, I, I think Tom Hanks totally would have deserved the Oscar had he won. I think Russell Crowe to totally deserved the Oscar and he did win. And I think I would think the same way had it been reversed, had Tom Hanks won and Russell Crowe not. I would have been fine with it because Tom Hanks was amazing in Castaway. But me personally, no, I thought they got it right. I, I thought they got it right with Russell Crowe that year. Um, so anyway, that's just my opinion on that. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question comes to us from Marcos Lopez, who writes, Hey, AMC, I was just wondering if there was a 28 months later in the works. 28 days and 28 weeks later were great, in my opinion, and they got good box office numbers. Your thoughts? Um... Yeah, I mean, ever since 28 Weeks Later came out, there there was a thought that maybe there could be a 28 Months Later. I don't believe anybody ever officially said, as I take a drink of water here, I don't think anybody ever in any official capacity said, we're going to make a 28 Months Later. It just seemed like the natural progression. And if you saw 28 Weeks Later, you know that they absolutely left it open-ended enough that, that I mean, they, they could have made a 28 Months Later. Here's the thing, though, and I'm, I'm super glad, Marco, that you like 28 Weeks Later. Personally, I didn't. Um, yeah, per personally, just me, just this is just me, just my opinion. Uh, I didn't like 28 Weeks Later all that much. I thought it was okay, but it was okay at best. I thought it was a big drop in quality from the original. But here's the big thing, and I've talked about this before, is the trajectory of box office. I believe the first... Um, 28 days later, worldwide, I believe, around $85 million, which is great. So then they do the sequel, 28, 28 weeks later. And what they want to see, that what the studios want to see, is that the box office does this. They wanted to see 28 weeks later and make 90, 95, $100 million at the box office. But instead, what happened is it did this. And while the first 28 days later made around 85 million, the second one made about 65 million. So you saw about a 25% drop in box office. So it was doing this instead of this. And that's not what the studios want to see. So the fact that less people were interested in it than they were, than they were in the first one, the fact that the second one, a lot less people like the second one as opposed to the number of people that like the first one, what that says to the studios is don't make a third because I, we, they, they think the trajectory will drop off even more. So I don't think we're going to see a 28 months later. I know there were some people kind of whispering and talking about it, some rumors and some, some people saying, you know, we're looking at maybe doing something like this, but I, I don't think it, anything ever got solid or that it was ever a real possibility, and I don't think there are any plans for it. But, but who knows? Maybe you guys have heard something that I have not. Once again, collectively, we're a lot smarter than just this guy sitting behind the microphone, so please leave your comments with links in the description or in the uh, comment section below if you've heard something different and, and maybe what your source is, and we can all learn something. All right, uh, last question of the day. This one comes to us from Ralph Terry. And Ralph Terry writes, really cool question. He writes, hello, AMC Movie Talk, the best damn movie show on the web. I wanted to ask, now that the Academy Awards are fully over, I wanted to ask, what do you think holds more prestige or weight? Winning an Oscar for anything in any category or getting an honoree award? I think getting an honorary award means more because even though not figuratively, anyone can win an Oscar if they give a great performance in a movie that year. But to win an honoree award Oscar means that you are uh, ingrained in some way into the history of movies. Just curious as to what everyone else thinks. Thanks. Um, I love the question, Ralph. I really do. And I'm going to agree with you. I think, look, there is no higher honor that 
that your peers in the film industry can bestow upon you than giving you an Oscar. There's no greater honor. As I mean, if you're a screenwriter, if you're a cinematographer, if you're a sound editor, if you're a costume designer, if you're an actor, if you're a director, if you're a producer, if you're, you know, any of those things, there is no greater honor than having your peers in the film industry bestow upon you an Academy Award uh, in any given year. That's huge. But you get a guy like Cuba Gooding Jr., who won an Academy Award, um, and he deserved it that year. He did. But we've seen his, the quality of his career kind of go downhill ever since then. But he won an Academy Award, fully deserved, with all the honor that goes along with it. But then you get a guy like George Lucas, um, who never won an individual Academy Award. And, and But you look at the career, the career that George Lucas has had, the impact George Lucas has had, not just on film fans, but on the film industry as a whole, the pushing of new technologies, Skywalker Sound, Industrial Light and Magic, um, all the different things, the way he pushed the, the entire film industry forward into the digital age, what the Star Wars movies and the Indiana Jones movies, the impact and the influence that those films have had on the entire landscape of the world of film and movies can't be denied. And so there's something I think very special when the Academy Award says, and I believe Sidney Poitier received one uh, as well. A, a, a lot of greats in Hollywood have. It's like being inducted into the Hall of Fame, basically. It's saying not only did you do one film great, you have left an imprint on the entire movie industry, probably forever. And for that, we bestow upon you an honorary Academy Award. I, I, I'll say this, I think, I think that would that award, let's say I won an award as a director and I won a, an alt, a Lifetime Achievement Honorary Award. I think that Lifetime Achievement Honorary Award would sit a little bit higher on my mantle than the other one. I got to say, I really do. I think that one would sit just a little bit higher on my mantle than another one. You know, Peter O'Toole. No, who's going to argue that Peter O'Toole was not one of the greatest actors of all time? Of all time. Nominated for, for a, an Acting Academy Award, I believe, seven times. Might have been six, but I believe it was seven. I'll have to look it up. And, but, but it just so happened that never was there a year where even though his performance was one of the best, that it was actually the best and he never actually won. And, and remember, individual year Academy Awards are not bestowed upon who's the best overall. It's who was the best that year. None of us will argue that Peter O'Toole is one of the greatest actors of all time and that he's given us some of the most memorable performances in history, but he never actually won an Academy Award. And so what did the Academy do a few years ago? They gave him the Lifetime Achievement, the, the, the Honorary Award. And I believe that award, that doesn't just symbolize greatness in one year or in one film, but rather is the symbol of a career of greatness. To me, that sits a little bit higher on your mantle than other ones. So I'm going to agree with you. Now, I know others will disagree, and that's totally cool. I'm sure there's some very good arguments to be made the other way. I'm just letting you know that personally, I fall, I happen to agree with Ralph on this, that I believe those honorary ones, and, and there's a reason why you stop the Academy Awards and bring out a montage clip and have a special presenter to come out and you honor somebody like that. I believe that award means just a little bit more. And uh, that's just my opinion on that. Anyway, folks, that'll do it for me today. I'm all wrapped up here. Thank you so much for joining me. Listen, I want to remind you, tomorrow's AMC Movie Talk. Now, AMC Movie Talk usually goes up anywhere between 10 a.m. and noon Pacific Standard Time. Tomorrow, it's going to be up in the evening. It's going to be late because I've got to travel all day tomorrow. And I'm going to do tomorrow's mailbag, provided there are no catches, no, nothing, no big problems come up. I'm going to do tomorrow's mailbag from Las Vegas because uh, I'll, I'll be pulling into Las Vegas tomorrow night. So it will be late, but there is a mailbag tomorrow. It's just going to be late, and that's why it's going to be late. So thanks a lot for your patience, guys. Don't forget, 
Lots of great movies playing in AMC theaters right now. Best movie theater chain in the world. Yeah, I'm not biased at all. Uh, head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. And listen, if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our YouTube channel. To keep you up to date on everything going on in the world of movies, click that thumbs up button. And hey, also, listen, you may not know this, but there is an audio-only podcast of this show, and we now include, we didn't for a long time, but we now include AMC Mailbag in our podcast stream. So if you look in the description of the video, you'll find links to our Stitcher and our iTunes so you can subscribe, subscribe to our audio-only podcast. So that'll do it for me, guys. Thanks a lot for joining me. My name's John Campia for AMC Movie News, and until next time, Bye-bye.